My name is Scott Porter and I'm with CAPSIT and um, we're going to talk a little bit today about a project that we're doing for the U.S. Department of Justice and um, I, I, I kind of want to spend just a few minutes talking about the project itself, what it is, the technology, but really the majority of the discussion this morning is going to be around some of the issues that we've been dealing with when it comes to um, the whole idea of deploying a free and open application in a government um, uh, environment and kind of what what sorts of issues that we've been dealing with um, not so much of you know is Linux good or bad is open source good or bad but what's the reality of in our particular sector, our particular market segment, what's the reality been of the adoption of the whole concept of what does free software mean? What does open software mean? And um, some of the differences between sort of a developer's perspective of what that means and the actual end user. So um, while the first few minutes I am going to talk about the project, what I really want to get into is kind of some of the issues and then you know maybe have some discussion about sort of what our experience has been. We're still in the middle of this project and I think that there's a lot of areas and issues still to sort of be sorted out in terms of how are these applications going to be adopted and what are some of the um, overall issues. So um, it's really not a, a technical in nature discussion as much today as it is more of a uh, policy and governance, I think. So just to give you a bit, little bit of a background, who is Capsit? Um, we're a small company. We're incorporated in, uh, we have our main office in Jacksonville, Florida. I happen to work out of Philadelphia and Larry's here with me from Portland. Um, there's three principles. We all came from different parts of uh, either IT or the public sector and our domain expertise primarily is around public safety. So this project is a public safety and justice project. And um, the, the principals in the company, we've all known each other more than 10 years and sort of came to the idea of, um, you know, where, where is open technology going and there's probably a better way to deploy applications into the public sector, especially in the public safety area that we're familiar with. So we formed CAPSIT, we've been around for about four years now and we've been working on this Department of Justice project for about the last two and a half. So basically what our focus is as a company, I mean we're a for-profit company, we focus on developing mission critical applications, we have a development methodology and framework that we use, so we're really about the technology but as a small company in this space we're kind of trying to figure out what is, what is a good way for us to develop and embrace open source to thrive as a company and to provide better applications into this, um, into the government sector. Um, so what we think we're trying to do is we're trying to offer a low cost but high value alternative by combining sort of the best of open source, uh, the best of free software distribution, and this whole kind of new licensing model with a uh, viable business uh, model that allows agencies to adopt these platforms and not do it at the risk of, hey, you know, it's a bunch of developers and then they go away, then we're left with an application we can't support. So that's kind of how we, how we started. Um, the Open RMS, RMS is for Records Management System. It's primarily a criminal justice uh, system. The Open RMS project started with a grant by the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Science and Technology, um, back in January of 2005. Um, the focus of that grant was providing technology to uh, small and rural law enforcement. Essentially, uh, in justice, they have a problem. Well, I'm going to get into a little bit of what the problem statement of the grant was, but essentially it's a, um, it's a project to develop a, a very robust records management application for justice. There's lots of seats up front. Um, we, as part of this project, uh, we're developing really uh, the, the primary application is this records management system. We've also deployed a sub-application of that called Open Scheduler, which was sort of a first iteration of a scheduling piece of software. And uh, we've developed a community of practitioners, uh, which are developers and users, 
uh, which started as a CAPSA community and has evolved into this Free for Gov, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And the current status is we do have pilots running in Texas um, on the border, and we're working with the uh, Texas Department of Homeland Security to um, uh, expand that pilot, and uh, we have pilots uh, that will be running in the first quarter of next year in Alaska. And um, beginning the second stage of development with uh, U.S. Department of Justice and Navy Spay War funding primarily and uh, trying to mature the community. We'll get into a little bit more of each of these areas in detail, but I want to give you a kind of a, a high-level snapshot. So the problem statement, and again, I'm, I'm, I, I want to just sort of talk about the application a little bit, but then get into the problems which I think are much more generic. But in government, I think in public safety and in this particular domain of government, these issues are fairly similar to other sectors within government. Um, what the problem was for justice was they have a huge number of police departments in the country. It's in the high 80s, maybe even as much as 90 percent, where the departments themselves are very small. So they have limited resources. They have limited technical resources. They have limited funding. They have limited people. They have limited capabilities. Um, the percentage of departments that are large have technology, they have capability, they have people, but what they lack is they lack any sense of control over their applications. So when you get up to the large metropolitan agencies or the state level agencies, they have good people, but they don't have applications that they can get their hands on and manipulate and change and contribute to. Um, then what you had was you had the state and federal primarily in Department of Justice mandating interoperability. So the, the, the big you know, buzzword was we have to be able to communicate from the local level all the way up to the federal level and we want to bring out these standards and in order for us to comply with these standards these departments had to have very sophisticated systems. So the smaller departments were lacking in these sophisticated systems so there was a huge gap of what the smaller departments had the capability to implement in order to comply with these standards and that's kind of where we came in. What we said was we think that we can develop an application that would be uh, perfectly suitable for a very large metropolitan or state level department but could be deployed inexpensively if we develop it with a certain licensing model and if we develop it on a certain platform it could be deployed very inexpensively in the smaller rural communities. So in Texas for example uh, we have a, a a setup of five counties that are sort of centralized this, uh, around this one county and the biggest department has 40 deputies and the smallest department has two and they cover like you know 25,000 square miles of these you know with half a dozen deputies because it's just rule right so they have these issues and they don't have any technical wherewithal uh, but they do have reports and they do have information and they do have to comply so these were kind of the basic problems that led us to getting the first grant. Um, we felt like that there was a whole, a, a better way to sort of approach this particular problem. And from my days, um, Larry and I worked together at Gartner, from my days at Gartner, um, you know, when you study other sectors in government, they all have similar problems. Okay. Um, so in the public safety domain, there were some unique characteristics that led us to the particular platform and application decisions that we came to. Um, first of all, in the public safety area, the business process is really not well defined. As much as you might think, you know, a crime occurs in Portland is the same as a crime in Philadelphia and the process should relatively be the same, they're really not. Um, each department has different procedures, each department has a different set of forms, each department sort of has a different way that they've been doing things forever and they are reticent to change those things. Okay. Um, the other thing is that the requirements change frequently, especially with the focus on um, terrorism at a local level, um, the whole idea of how policing is done, community-oriented policing, a lot of that stuff requires the departments to be extremely flexible and in order for the departments to be flexible their systems have to be flexible and usually if the system is flexible it tends to be complex behind the scenes right so if the user can experience great flexibility and change things and do things very easily differently every single time it tends to be more complex on the back end or behind the scenes 
Um, the other thing that was particularly interesting in, public, in, in justice is the data model is really not stable. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, unlike a, a financial application where both parties have an interest in the data being accurate, in the justice model, both parties have an interest in, well, one party has an interest in the information being as inaccurate as possible, while the other party tries to constantly make it accurate. So there's sort of always this moving and shaking of, you know, here's the data model. These are, these are the 200 attributes that define a person. All right, and then comes along, you know, some new way of identification or some new thing that we have to collect every time we book something, somebody, or some new thing we have to collect every time we go on a traffic stop, and the data model from the business perspective has to be extremely flexible. Um, the data is relatively unstructured. Relationships aren't well known. Uh, we don't know why a relationship between person A and person B and person C is important when we collect it. It may become important later on down the road. So there's was, there was a whole set of interesting problems that we wanted to take a different approach to how we solved them. Um, and so that kind of led us into um, uh, the application as we, as we started to develop it. Um, this is what I call my motherhood and apple pie slide. Everybody wants a system like this. Um, you know, functional, easy to use, adaptive, scalable. Yeah, yeah, okay, so we know that. But what's interesting about this slide is, depending on your perspective, you will order these things differently. Okay, so if you're a user, you want it functional and easy to use. You don't care how much it costs. You don't care if it's adaptive. You don't, you, know, you don't care about those things. But if you're an administrator or you're the systems administrator, you might prioritize these things differently. And so what we saw was, we saw the challenge being, can we make things, can we make an application that equalizes these things, that provides levers and controls in each of these areas, and how do we do that? And we found that an open model that allows for lots of flexibility and allows for the users to get their fingers into it, all right, actually gives agencies much more control over all of these things. So if we accept the ideas of open source platforms, we make things more affordable, we give more choices. If we accept the idea that functionality has to be controlled at the end user level as much as possible, then we develop a system that encourages that rather than restrains that. Um, so while these are pretty common amongst any application, we felt like we were constantly trying to make decisions so that the users or the and I mean user meaning maybe from a technical perspective or the actual end user has a lot of control over each of these. So in, in our architecture basically we have a very flexible data structure that's based primarily on XML. Um, we use XML to store the actual data rather than in the relational database. We use the database primarily for relationships and we use search engine technology on top of that. So the architecture is quite different and unique of our particular application and I, and I mention that because um, where we think we're going with this, we have a platform that then enables you to build lots of different types of applications on it. It's not just built strictly for criminal justice. Um, it's really built for any kind of um, business application where you need to, you know, collect data, manipulate data, um, and carry records of really any kind. This is the last of the sort of technical, uh, basically, the application's platform independent. Um, the, the infrastructure is all open source. Um, what was interesting is that we have to constantly balance when we make a decision about something. We say, okay, well, we need uh, mapping functionality, for example. You know, we need to be able to do GIS and mapping. Well, we have one set of customers, potential users of the application, that you have to absolutely have a totally free alternative for. They have to have an alternative where, where even if we give our application away, they wouldn't be required to buy some third-party license in order to have that thing. But that may not be the best alternative, right? So from our perspective, we try to keep the core application independent of any of these underlying things. So a, um, an agency, for example, a large metropolitan agency might say, hey, uh, we've standardized on a particular operating system, but we want to use your open application. 
So we're in our development, we constantly try to make decisions that don't depend on any particular piece of underlying infrastructure. And that's how we're keeping the application as open as possible. Right? So if you want to deploy it on your um, IBM boxes running IBM's version of, uh, of whatever they happen to run on, we can, we can deploy that way. Um, so what was interesting though was we have this sort of very low end and very high end requirement and we're trying to always make decisions to allow for those kinds of um, uh, decisions for the, for the end user to make those decisions. The other thing is, and the talk this morning was interesting because there are a lot of standards, um, especially dealing with the exchange of information, that we need to be compliant with, but at the same time, uh, where, where I think that there's a tension is that you have this standard, for example, in the, um, uh, in the justice world, they have the Global Justice XML Data Model, which is you know, sort of an attempt to identify every single data attribute that would ever be imagined for you know, justice, okay? The problem with that is it's so huge, it can't be implemented in the real world. And it's just, a, it's just a standard of a way of exchanging. And, and the, the example I like to give is, in the Global Justice Data Model, which is an attempt to standardize, there's five choices for how you can represent the zip code. Okay, so they didn't really pick a standard, they just said if you're gonna represent the zip code, here are five ways you can do it. You can do USPS, you can do international, you can do this, you can do this. So the data model is huge. So in order to be compliant, what some vendors or some people are doing is they're saying, okay, well, we'll build our system around the data model. Well, when you do that, it doesn't work for the end user. So you have to, you have to sort of weigh that. So we're trying to be compliant with these standards as they emerge. Um, and again, that's one of our core or key choices was using XML, we can have our own internal sort of way that we interpret and understand the data, but then externally be able to exchange in any number of different ways. Um, in terms of licensing, we do have an open, no fee license. Essentially, the, the, the way our license works is it's not not yet, and I don't know if it ever will be, an OSI certified open license because we do have a government restriction in there. Um, so far, Justice and that community isn't quite ready to just say, hey, you know, we'll just license, license this core application out to everybody, so it is restricted to government use. We do have some restrictions on um, the um, uh, actual source code and where the source code can be, but for the end user, the source code is available, it's open, it can be changed and manipulated. Um, the, the license does require that um, enhancements come back at, through the community, so if an agency has developers and they choose to make enhancements, um, they are just required to share those back, and whether they get integrated into the core or not is sort of a different story. Um, then uh, in terms of agency control, uh, the application is very, um, uh, a lot of the customizations, nearly every customization can be made um, outside of the developer level. So most of the stuff is all customized through data. Um, most of, we have, we have a whole set of tools for customizations that really just a good system administration type person can use to customize the application. Um, so this will get kind of into what the, what the real purpose of this presentation is. The costs of deployment, of course, are infrastructure costs. You know, free is never free when it comes to buying hardware. Uh, Third-party software where it's required. So far, we haven't required any. The GIS area is one where we're st still a little bit shaky on in terms of what's going to be the right fit there. And, and of course, network and communications. I mean, it's a, it's a pure web application, so uh, the network needs to be there, and there's infrastructure costs. And, and really, in our um, sites in, in both Alaska and Texas, that's been the real challenge, is you know, how, does the, how does the network get built out in a way, and who covers those costs? And then, of course, there's the deployment and support costs. Um, the, the spectrum is agency independent. They go, they get the application. They never deal with anybody, and they implement it. 
um, and then there's sort of different levels uh, where they share with another agency, where they use community-based support, or where they, you know, just go out and buy an implementation, basically. Um, we also developed this CAPSIC community. It started as a CAPSIC community. It's now the foundation for free and open source in, gov in government, which I'll talk about more in a minute. But essentially, the online community, we have about 250 members now, but it's primarily practitioners. What's really interesting about this project, and when I get into the next section, is that the community is less interested about the technology. Like when you look at open source applications, it's primarily for technicians. There are infrastructure level applications. The technicians are interested in the, in the actual code and contributing to the code. But on the application level, on the, on, for something like what we're doing, it's more practitioners. They really are more interested in getting the application, using the application, learning how to use the application, less interested in making changes to the code, right? So um, this particular community is open to developers as well, but again, if you look at that sort of uh, the, the bulk of the potential users in this particular case, they don't have a lot of core developers. You know, the developers are really at the state level or at the large metropolitan department level. Um, these are people that are, you know, technically astute, but maybe not developers and are just interested in participating and, and um, uh, seeing, the, seeing the project continue on. The community right now is really, the CAPSA community is really project centric around these projects. Um, they focus on requirements and, you know, sort of what the system should do and how it should do it. Um, and our experience so far is a very high level of interest and a low level of actual participation. So we get a lot of people interested, we get a lot of people signing in, reading, seeing what's going on, but not a lot of people actually engaging in conversation and participating. And I think part of that has to do with the maturity of the application. People are sort of taking a wait and see, you know, let's see it actually rolled out in, in more agencies. And part of it is people just flat out don't have a lot of time. It's a great idea in theory and you, we just, people just don't have time to participate. So this is really the core of what I want to get into today. That's kind of just the background of what the project is all about, the technology side of the project. But here are some of the, I, I, I call them myths and misconceptions. Um, I gave this presentation a few months ago, this particular piece of it, to uh, a Department of Justice audience and it was sort of a shock to them because, you know, they're sponsoring this project and they have kind of a, a one view of what free software means. And so this was kind of a, a, our way of starting to introduce the idea that there are a lot of other issues around just, you know, you're going to build something, you're going to pay for it to be built and then just give it away and that's the end of the story and it really isn't. So the first myth that we have to overcome and we still have this problem a lot is that if you're a small agency, you don't need the same functionality as a larger agency. So if you're a small police department with five, you don't need the same functionality as a large police department with 500 or 5,000, okay? And that's totally wrong. Um, if you're a small agency that does the same function as a larger counterpart, you just do less of it. And in fact, it's probably harder for you to do because you have less resources, right? So what you find in smaller agencies, and again, I'm using this public safety and justice because that's been our experience, but I think it, it translates very well. The, the cops in small departments tend to be cops and dispatchers and records clerks and all these other things, whereas the cops in larger departments, you work patrol, that's all you do. You don't do anything else. So they get the benefit of actually, you know, having more people and being able to specialize. So what we found was there, there was kind of a, a, a mindset, especially amongst the project sponsors, that, hey, why are, you, why are you building this complex record system? We're talking about an agency that has four people. Well, yeah, but they still have 500 pieces of paper that they deal with. They still make the cases the same way. They still deal with the courts. They still do all of those things. They just do it on a lower scale. And this one has probably been the most difficult to overcome. That just because you're building this thing for, quote, small agencies doesn't mean, because what's happened traditionally is the small agencies do get less than. They have less money, so they have to buy a record system that's not very good, right? Or they have to do without a record system. 
Um, so they have the same operational needs. The primary concern really ought to be on secure and reliable data collection, not on the volume of collection. Okay? They can't take shortcuts on security because they're small. It's the same, they have the same data issues. Uh, the data sharing initiatives can't succeed if the local, a local agencies don't have the tools. So what happens, like if you look at the state of Texas, you have 245 counties, you have you know, 800 and some agencies, and you have maybe 12 large agencies. right? So if you look at all of the records that are coming from all of the agencies, you take those 12 out, that's probably 50 or 60 percent of the records. And then all these other little tiny agencies make up a huge percentage of the actual records. So they need a way to do the same things, but they're doing it on this odd scale. Okay? So what we're trying to, what, what we have to overcome constantly is if you do anything less, you're actually creating more of a risk than just leaving them alone. If you're going to do less, then just leave them alone and let them use paper and let them just continue doing what they're doing. Okay? The next myth was, if you give it away for free, there's going to be a whole lot less for the agency to do. Okay, explain that one to me. I don't know how that works, but that's the, that's the thinking. If, if we're making free software, why are we asking the agency to decide how their workflow is going to be. Why are we asking the eight? Well, well, because just because I'm giving it to them doesn't mean they don't have to still participate in all of these decisions, right? So the challenges of implementing a system, whether it's a super complex system, a records management system does tend to be kind of complex, or you're giving them word, you know? Uh, in, in Texas, they have a whole project going on right now where they're giving them, they're giving them laptops off of um, a government surplus. The laptops are all, have all kinds of applications on them, and they're sending them out there and they're saying, hey, isn't it great you guys have laptops? And they're like, you know, we don't know what to do with these, right? So they've created this whole need for training and this whole need for, um, you know, well, how do we do it? And it doesn't alleviate the departments from making difficult decisions. See, especially in justice, the interesting thing is all about interoperability and information sharing. I want to be able to share with my neighbor. I want to be able to share with Border Patrol. I want to be able to do all that. And that's nice in public. That's nice to say that. But at the end of the day, you have a local sheriff who's been elected to do certain things. And that guy's got to make a decision. What is it going to mean if somebody knows how many cases I'm actually working? Right? So the implication is they, they now have to make very difficult decisions even though you're kind of giving it away. And the, and the thing that people get distracted by is, isn't this going to be great? Everyone's going to get software and it's going to be free. Right? So the reality is there's still things that have to be done. Somebody still has to configure hardware. Somebody still has to figure out what, how the software is actually going to work in their department. Somebody has to still do security. Somebody has to do all these things that they've never had to do before. Right? And those things never come for free. I don't, I mean, even if you say, well, you know, the agency doesn't have to pay for it, that's fine. Somebody's paying for a person to go out and do those things. Right? And whether they pay a company or whether they pay their internal people, whether they pay, in, for example, in uh, Texas, they have a program now with University of Houston. Well, somebody's getting, nobody's doing that for free. All right? And those things still have to be done. Um, this one I think everybody's familiar with, you know, I mean, this is sort of the core thing. You can say the application is free, there's no licensing cost, there's a tremendous savings, there's a great business case for it, but it doesn't mean it's free, right? There's costs, and this one I think we had a really hard time with, with justice, and I'm not picking on them, it just happens to be where this particular case was, but because what they said was, okay, you built this record system, it's a great system, and um, you know, a records management system is extremely a complex system. Why don't you just put it on a CD and we'll mail it out to every department? Okay. Well, how's that going to work? <laughs> you know, um, what are they going to run it on? Uh, how is it going to get configured? And so, well, you mean it just doesn't come up and tell them how to how to do everything? No, it doesn't do that. Well, why not? Well, because it's more complicated than that, and so they're starting to think, well, gee, we have this free software, but the departments are acting, I mean, there's going to be some cost in implementing it. How are we going to deal with that? 
you know. And I think that, that what we have to do is have to start to change our thinking on what are the possibilities of dealing with that. Because to some agencies, when you get to Dimmick County, Texas, right, which is just open space, they will probably never have the ability to pay for anything. Okay, so that's the reality. So maybe they need a different way of getting at this software, right? Not making it so that they can afford it so that we can ship a piece of hardware, but maybe they never see a piece of hardware. Maybe they just get to get online and they get subsidized by the counties around them, you know? So um, the other thing that's interesting about this one is as you try to make things available for these small departments, they're the ones that need the most help. So they tend to be the most costly to implement, right? Because you actually physically, a lot of times, have to send somebody out to an agency because they got nobody there, right? Versus an agency where I can give uh, you know, a piece of free software to the city of Austin and never talk to them again, and they're fine, right? So the whole idea that free software means there's no cost is one that we've really had a challenge overcoming. Um, this is another one that gets interesting, and again, this kind of goes back, I use, the, I use the CD example. Well, why don't you just put it on a CD? Can't we just stick it on a thumb drive and send it out and then they can use it? Well, I guess you could, but you know, they're not, what's it going to do, right? Um, the single distribution strategy is linked in some way in people's minds to free, which is linked to easy. Right? So if it's free piece of software, and we're, we're not the only ones. I mean, DOJ sponsored a couple other projects that kind of went the same way. They, they have a modeling and simulation piece of software. It's a really good piece of software. They contracted for it to be developed. The company developed it, put it out on a CD. They give it away at every conference. And now that CD is a year and a half old. There's no support. The code has been evolving and changing, but there's no mechanism to update those distributions. So this idea that there's a single plug and play distribution for complex business applications, this might work for some applications. I mean, our scheduler, which is, which is, has a lot of functionality, but it's pretty straightforward to use. That might work with something like this. You know, you plug it in, you kind of can figure out how to use it. Maybe you go online, get some documentation, some online training, that kind of thing. But with a complex business application, think of taking the most complex financial tax application and saying, hey, it's free, let's put it on a CD and let's send it out. You know, it doesn't really work that way. So what we have to do is we have to think of different distribution strategies that will work for different agency sizes and different um, kind of domains. And one distribution strategy is not going to work for everybody. And that's why we sort of like the model of the open application. We like the open source um, infrastructure layer because it gives a lot of flexibility in the distribution strategy. So if you have an agency that has absolutely, you know, they have no computing infrastructure, they might do well with sort of a generic Linux box that's pre-configured with all the software in a certain way that gets sent out and then they get supported kind of online as they come up. But, but just, you just tell them, don't ever look at the box, don't touch the box, don't speak to the box, just turn it on and the system will work. That distribution strategy might be better for that agency than sending them a CD and trying to explain to them how to be a Linux administrator. Right? So this is something that is slowly coming around, but again, I think it's, not, it, it's, it's still kind of fuzzy in people's minds of how this is going to work. Um, in our particular domain, security and data integrity is key, so that makes distribution on a CD and just saying, hey, do whatever you want with it, very difficult. They wanted to know why we wouldn't put the source code on the CD. Well, first of all, 99% of the people that are going to use the application aren't going to know what to do with the source code. Right? And secondly, it makes it very difficult to keep the application secure when you have no idea who's getting or using it. Um, and then I think the last point is really a, a reasonable, a reliable, and a very repeatable distribution strategy is the only way these applications are really going to be able to be adopted widely. Um, Free software users don't need professional support. This is sort of a, a similar in vain, but basically the idea that once they're up and running, that's it, right? We don't need to do anything else. And the, the fact of the matter, again, is, uh, again, we need to be able to offer the ability for these agencies to support themselves, but in maybe different ways. Like in Texas, what we're trying is 
sort of supporting a sent one agency like a sponsor agency with professional level support and then that agency is then making the contacts with sort of the remote satellite agencies and some of those agencies don't need anything but but those agencies don't actually have to pay for support they don't have a direct support relationship they sort of just stay in their neighborhood if you will and then either the state or a private company supports that kind of hub area and that seems to be working well but the fact of the matter is these applications again complex applications they need to be supported especially if they're evolving all the time This one is, is sort of interesting. Um, if there's a free alternative, and we, uh, you know, the speaker this morning kind of talked a little bit about this. The government has a natural um, interest in collaboration. There's a lot of good collaborative projects out there. And there isn't that same competitive edge idea. It's, uh, the idea is really to collaborate and to share ideas and to share thoughts. So one of the things that um, a lot of people have been talking about, well, is once this free alternative is out there, everybody is going to use it. And that's really not the case either, right? I mean, there, there are a lot of issues that have to be considered with this. And the free part is really just in the licensing. It's, it's just that one piece. There's still a, a huge number of other costs. So there are a few barriers to, uh, to cooperation, again, in, in public when you're talking about it in public, the concept is a good concept. But in reality, there's, there's a whole issue of political realities, there's a whole issue of domain, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole bunch of issues that um, I think the whole idea of, boy, if we really promote and push for a free alternative, it's going to solve all these other problems and it's not going to. So that's something that we had to be, and we continue to have to be really careful about. Um, the, the idea of local control is very important, and I think that's true no matter what the domain is. Um, there's still a huge range of views on the risks and benefits of free and open and what that means. And um, the free part of it doesn't always include full assurance of availability. Right? Okay, so the bottom line is I think that our project is a very good use case for a centralized funding of a project that would have a very wide distribution. So what Justice is trying to do is an excellent idea. They're trying to centrally fund the development of an application instead of going and offering grants, which they still do and they used to do a lot. If you were a small department and you needed a record system, you applied for a grant and you got money and you bought a record system and then you figured everything else out. And they were spending a lot of money creating these one-off sort of solutions and now what they're trying to do is can we centrally fund the development of something that could be widely distributed and used, okay? That's great, but what comes with that is the whole uncertainty of how's it going to be uh, supported, how is it going to be distributed, how are we going to uh, be assured that this thing can continue to grow and evolve. And justice and, and the federal government isn't usually really good at that. right? They're really good at kind of getting the initial thing out there, but not really good at its longevity. Um, so what, what I think that we're missing is sort of a trusted, independent, third party place where there can be at least some level of free assurance and support that goes along with a free license. And that's what's really missing and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're, what we're thinking of and what we're trying to do with that. Um, I think that there's a con kind of a continuum of options. There's the traditional open source project. Why not just t make these projects, we fund them, we, we, and then we put them out on source board somewhere and we just say, hey, there's a project. If you're interested in, uh, in uh, records management, go out there into the government source forge and go get it and do it, you know. Um, the problem with that is they're very technically oriented. You know, the chief of police in a little department is not going to benefit from that because they don't have anybody that can do it. I mean, the whole open source community today is a, is a very technically oriented community, you know. Um, there's high, a high variability of the standards of the actual code that's out there. And um, it is very low cost, but it tends to be higher risk. A government-sponsored sp project, there are good examples of this where a government agency, a state agency, for example, develops an application and then shares it. 
right? They make the source code available, they share it out, they say, hey, if you want to use it, you can use it, we'll collaborate, we'll share costs, we'll do all of that. Um, the Iowa Tracks is a good example of that. There's a, there's a couple other really good examples of that. The shortcoming of that particular option is that it's dependent on that particular state agency continuing to get funded. So if a new governor comes in or a new you know, city manager comes in and says, you know, I really like all of these partners that we have, but it's not my job to fund them. We are concentrating on our project and we're not involved in this anymore. So there's that kind of uh, lack of continuity potentially. There's a software as service option, which is essentially the idea that an application gets developed, it gets put out there, there's some kind of public-private partnership that makes that application available. Uh, depending on the domain, this may or may not be even an option, right? Some domains, like justice in particular, it's very difficult to outsource the holding of public criminal records. So that, that market, that segment, is probably not going to go for something like this. But they might go for a model where the records are being held at a government entity, right, with some kind of partnership. Um, and then the last one is a trusted independent third party, which is providing kind of a continuity of support services, uh, being financially supported by donations and grants, and provides a no-cost assurance to equality and support and oversight. And this is kind of where I want to end. Um, my next slide is this foundation for free and open source in government, which is where Larry comes in, um, where Larry is the executive director of this. This is a brand new thing that we're trying. Um, it's independent from CAPSIT. It's a, it's a nonprofit corporation. It's incorporated here in Oregon. And essentially what we're trying to do here is we're trying to provide a place where applications can live that are licensed in some free and open way, but also provides the assurance of support, at least at a basic level. And this is different than, you know, kind of going and saying, well, here's SourceForge. Where so SourceForge is good is it's a place where the application code can live. What this is is less about the code and more about providing some basic level of support and assurance around these applications so that if your agency said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a try, we're going to try open RMS, that there is some intelligence and some um, understanding of how the application works and some understanding of the support that's removed from the company that actually developed it or the agency that actually developed it. And this third party or this nonprofit gets supported by either grants or by companies that want to promote the use of open source in government, okay, and want to be able to provide this basic level of assurance. So um, we think that there's something there because it's definitely a piece that's missing from our project, and I think from most projects and from widespread adoption, we think there's something there to having this particular entity or organization. Um, what the foundation doesn't do is they don't develop applications. They're not there to develop anything. Um, they don't own the license to the applications. You're not giving up your license or IP rights. We want to encourage companies to participate in this using their own license, but it's a place that there's a kind of a common way to collaborate and a common way to exchange ideas. Um, they don't promote one particular application over another. But what they, what they, and they don't provide four fee services. So really what the, the foundation is all about is providing a basic level of services that are no cost to the end user. So if there's an agency that says, hey, I want to find out more about what's this open RMS project all about, we want to implement the open RMS project, how do we do it? This foundation would be able to provide that basic level of documentation and support. So that's basically, that's my presentation, that's uh, kind of been our experience so far and um, I don't know, what time does this end now? Uh, 15, minutes. 15 minutes. So just open it up for discussion, reaction, anybody have any similar experience? Every government agency has that. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. How do we fix it? How do we fix it? We don't. I mean, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant job of trying to convince management of the things, the misperception, all of the perceptions that they have and the myths that they believe. Every single time you change management report, you right. do it all over again. 
Right. It's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing. Yeah. And I think that's that's the, you know, there's one thing to say we're going to use Linux and, and replace the operating system, but it's a totally different thing in my view to say we're going to move to open applications or we're going to collaborate or, you know, and government has a huge potential for collaboration. It's just it's very difficult to actually do. Yeah. This last nonprofit doesn't seem, in my mind, to be necessarily tied to open source. It doesn't have to be, and yet you've done that. We have. Um, the reason we did that was we wanted to tie it to applications that were freely available so that agencies could go there and have these. This is where they'd have free alternatives. So if they wanted to go, the, the problem with if you buy a proprietary piece of software and you can actually buy the software, then you have the assurance of that company that you're buying it from and you have the assurance of support from them. That's the assumption that we're making. Yeah, that's where I think I was thinking differently. Yeah, yeah. So you would see non, you would see proprietary or non-open applications in that as well. I would, I guess I don't know for sure, but I would guess there's a lot of software that's very poorly supported. Right. That you have to pay for it. Yes. And you're not really paying for the support, you're just paying to get a disk. Yes. And it would be appropriate to have an organization that would then help you with the support issues. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not, not open to that. I think it's a good idea. Um, yes. Well, I've got three questions that are interrelated. Yes, no, yes. <laughs> oh. One is the uh, community, the open RMS community. They, uh, I think, have the configure or, uh, and then I guess finally, uh, change codes or requirements or return the code to CAPS it or to the community so that then it's shared again in a, you know, in an open and fully distributed way. And then with that in mind, and then thinking about the special license you created, can you either A, take the code that you've developed or, and or with these additions, um, issue it under another license that's either more open or more closed to the private sector. I mean, again, I'm thinking, you know, in, in criminal justice, there's all these, you know, privatized prisons. Right. And then suddenly you say, well, great, but now we're going to sell it in this in this other form. And then the, and then the final question tied to those two is then, can you talk a little bit about kind of business models potential for both your services and right. the software? I mean, licensing is the big question, right? We have to come up with something that um, balances the intent of the sort of open collaboration nature of an open license. I mean, when I was at Gartner, the biggest complaint we had from most of the agencies that were looking for software solutions in this space was, we've got smart people, we've got really good people, and we get the code and we can't do anything with it. We can't touch it, we can't look at it, we can't change it, we can't make it work the way we want it to work. So that kind of led us to the collaborative view. But at the same time, if you go to the other end of the extreme, which is sort of you have the university model or the state model or somebody with good intent building a good piece of application, and then no commercial capitalistic reason to keep that thing going all the time, right? those projects tend to fizzle out and die. So we're trying to balance that. So to get to your questions, the caps at license right now is meant to try to balance that. From the end user perspective, it's meant to leave it fully open, you have full access, you can collaborate, but there is a restriction, a requirement that basically says any changes or modifications you do have to come back to Capsit so that they can be incorporated or not, but, but at least available in the community. But we as a company own the license and we would own those changes. So basically what we're saying is in exchange for you getting the license, uh, here's a, you know, pick a number worth of records management software at no cost. If you make enhancements and improvements to that, those come back and are available to the community under the same license. So as a follow up to that, is the source code then under this license available to the general public for inspection, if not for use? It's not today. And it's not to the general public, but it is within the justice community. So there's another restriction there that has it restricted to public safety government agencies, not to the general public. Well, what sense is the open source at this point? 
It's not. I mean, it's not open source. I mean, we're not, o like I said in the beginning, we're not OSI certified. We could never be OSI certified because we have that restriction. Now, being a small company and still dealing with this application and trying to get the application out there, we've decided this is the best place for us to start. I don't know that that's where we'll end up. I don't know that we won't someday say, hey, we're going to just embrace an open license. A lot of it has to do with our customers as well who are not quite ready to go there um, in terms of, yeah. But there is that midpoint, right, where yeah. you make it available for people to inspect. Yes. To use, and, you know, yep. that, that would satisfy some, I think, really important concerns of the general public about what's being used to manage their record for its integrity. It seems to me that just in the context of a criminal case involving right. use of these records, you'd have a problem. Well, the problem exists, actually, you, you would address, the problem exists today Absolutely. because it's, it's zero uh, transparency. Right, but um, yeah, we're not opposed to that at all. What we want to do, though, is try to strike that balance where um, we or anybody that uses a license similar to this can continue to participate. Um, what what we see, what's interesting is we see a lot fewer agencies actually coding than agencies making changes to the configuration, and the actual coding we see happening on kind of a small percentage of the larger departments. But that could also be It's true. It, it, it is true. There's a little bit right, and and what the level of interest in each domain, each application's domain, versus you know, there's a huge community of people contributing to the operating system, but how many people are going to contribute to this, you know, tiny little thing? You don't know. You're right. It's a good point. Yeah. Within that, you mentioned. Uh, focus on some of your clients want GIS. And, yes. And there are people certainly who want some links to period dispatch where all records start. Yes. And so if you do have somewhat of a closed model, how do you work to where there may be vendors who are working in that space who want to integrate with your software? Yeah, I wouldn't say we're a closed model. Um, so that's where I guess I would differ with the view. We're open in, in a number of ways. First of all, if the agency is using our application, they have full access. So they have access to it. Secondly, the, our compliance, where we're, where we're going to probably focus on answering that question, is our compliance with the standards. Right? So the global justice standard is one. There's, um, there's a uh, justice reference architecture, which is another. What we're finding that's interesting is we're saying, OK, we're completely global justice compliant. We're 100% compliant. Okay. And here comes a CAD vendor, and we say, OK, great, you're compliant, right? Oh, no, we're not compliant. Well, almost nobody is compliant with those standards, so you end up with one-off interfaces anyway, right? But from our perspective, uh, for example, the way, we do, the way we handle interfaces is we basically have a scripting language that the user, the, the system administrator, can develop, OK, these particular attributes, they map to these attributes, and they might map to global justice, they might map to some other system, some state system, but they have the ability to create those interfaces and exchanges. So, go ahead. OK. <laughs> yes? It is not yet. No. Right. There, it, we're not compliant with that standard. Um, it was actually mentioned as we got involved with Spay War. They were really the first ones to mention it. DOJ, it's not sort of on their radar to be compliant with that. So we haven't yet looked at it. I'm, I'm sure it's possible to be, but it's not something that we're focused on right now. Yes. So the mis the myths that you covered. Uh, I heard several people say, "Oh, yeah, I've been there." How do you overcome them? Is simply presenting them and making people aware of them successful in overcoming those, or does it take some additional, I don't know, case studies or reports or something to really get people to believe those are myths? Yeah, I think I think it's it. 
it's basically presenting them and I also think with more and more applications that are coming out again the the focus has been in my my view has been on getting open source in the infrastructure level but as more applications come out these things are going to bubble to the top and more and more agencies are going to have to deal with them and I think that that at conferences like this we have to start talking about the applications and the implementation and the policy and those things as much as we talk about gee this is another this is an alternative operating system an alternative infrastructure yeah yes well, I want to commend you I've had experience dealing with police chiefs and law enforcement <laughs> if you're writing software to try and please a bunch of police chiefs you must be some kind of masochist <laughs> Well, it's, I hate to say it's all I know, so it's you know, sort of been in my, I've tried to leave this domain for a lot of years and I uh, always come back to it, so. Any other questions, thoughts? Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, you guys coming and sharing your <coughs> suggestions. Thanks.